Hey out there, legal warriors. What happens if you get called for jury duty? You get that notice in the mail and they want you to go to jury duty. What should you expect? How does the process work? And what are some tips for you to be able to get through this situation uh, and feel good about it? If you're interested in this area of the law, stay tuned. This is the video for you. My name is attorney Lance Fryer, and I'm a defense attorney in Linwood, Washington. My law firm's been defending crimes uh, for people all throughout Washington State for more than 20 years. And I'm putting out these videos to help educate the public. So if you find this useful, please like and please subscribe. More people will get the help they need. And I'm just going to jump right into it. This is a video about what to expect if you get summons for jury duty. And I know a little bit about that because I was summoned for jury duty a few years back and actually made it on the jury at least for a little bit, until uh, the judge uh, let the public defender take me off because I was well known in the community and the courtroom as a defense attorney. So um, that was a good strategy because I hear the jury found that person not guilty and I probably would have went the other way from what I knew about the case. But I sort of know a little something about uh, jury duty from the juror's perspective in addition from how us attorneys deal with jurors. So let's say you get a summons for jury duty. Number one, do you have to participate? Well, the answer legally is yes. You need to participate in the jury um, situation. The good news is, in depending on the court, you may not even have to participate at all. Um, the like local municipal courts or local smaller courts will usually have a phone number you call in to find out, do you actually have to come in for jury duty or not? Because there may or may not be a jury trial going on. On a bigger court, like Superior Court, there, there may not be the option. You probably need to go in regardless, follow the instructions because they have juries going all the time because of the size of the courtroom. There are some ways you can ask to be excused from jury duty and they're going to be on your form. You might have a medical problem that makes it impossible for you to appear. You may uh, be unable to appear due to, uh, you know, other life needs. You know, you're the sole caregiver of three small babies at home. Uh, maybe you're out of the country at the time. There's things that you can do, but for sake of this video, we assume that you're going to participate in the juror experience, and I'm going to let you know what to expect. So let's say that you uh, learn that you need to go to the jury as a possible juror. You go to the court, right? So um, you'll go to the courthouse. There's going to be a way for you to check in following the instructions, and then likely you're going to be given two things. You're going to be given a juror badge that you're going to wear. And the reason why you have a juror badge is so the participants in the legal system know not to talk to you, right? Not to discuss the case. If there's a jury trial, that's a big deal. There's witnesses, there's family members there, people's freedom or finances in a civil suit are on the line, right? And so there's going to be discussions about the case, things in the hallway. And if you're wearing a juror badge, People kind of quit talking to you that are involved in the case when you're around them because they don't want to cause a problem for the court case. The second thing you're going to be given is likely a questionnaire. Okay, you may have filled out some type of questionnaire ahead of time, but sometimes when you get to court, there's going to be another questionnaire that's going to ask you potentially specifics, specifics about the parties involved. A juror questionnaire, hey, do you know this person? Do you know that person? Has a family member ever been involved in the criminal system? Do you have any relatives that are judges or lawyers? Uh, what are your, you know, do you feel you can be fair in certain types of situations? You got to fill that out. And most likely you're going to be in a room with a whole bunch of other potential jurors. And the room that I was in was really boring. Okay, no one spoke. I saw people falling asleep. Um, um, it was, uh, wasn't a great experience. But I, it was better for me because I'm a defense attorney. I was really paying attention to uh, how this, you know, what the experience was like for a potential juror, at least in the court that I was in. Um, eventually, uh, you will get called, most likely, to go to some courtroom for a juror selection process in a particular case. It could be a criminal case. It could be a civil case. And usually there's going to be uh, you know, 20 or 30 people that get called to a particular courtroom. It could be less in a smaller jurisdiction. And then you're going to likely be seated in some chairs and you'll likely be have a number. You'll be given some type of number, like uh, you might sit in chair one or you might be told you're juror 14, right? And 
typically what happens is, uh, depending on how jury selection is being done, um, they will draw some numbers and they'll say, okay, juror two, eight, 17, whatever, you sit in these seats. Those are the people that are sort of in the box. Those are, if no jurors get excused for cause or what's called a peremptory challenge, those will be the jurors for the case, okay? And then everybody else remains seated where they're at, except for people that had to like step out of the box. What happens then is that each side gets to ask you questions. And that's called voir dire. Different places say it differently. That's sort of how I say it. Voir dire, voir dire, uh, different ways to say it depending on where you're from. But basically it gives the prosecution and the defense a chance to ask uh, the group and even individuals questions to sort of find out a little bit about what their life is like, their potential biases. Uh, you know, each side may think that a certain type of person may be a better juror for their side than another type of person, right? Someone who's been a victim of a crime, that might be uh, a good juror for a prosecutor, but not good for a defense attorney. Someone that doesn't like the police, that might be a good juror for a defense attorney, but not for a prosecutor. Someone that's been injured might be a good jury for, juror for a plaintiff's lawyer who's trying to sue for damages for their injured client and not so good for the insurance company's lawyer. And on and on and on. There's racial issues. There's all type of stuff. But bottom line is you're not likely to be embarrassed. Um, there's going to be questions. And what we should do is we should try to answer them truthfully because the juror process is the great equalizer, supposedly, in our legal system. So once you get asked questions in the group, uh, each attorney is going to get a chance to remove uh, jurors for cause, right? And so um, they might ask them, don't take that personally. It just means, hey, there's some reason that we think that legally you can't be a juror for this case, that, um, that legally you're automatically biased based upon your life experiences, or you know somebody, you know the the, the witness and therefore you can't be a fair juror automatically is what the court would think. So you could get removed for cause. And if you get removed, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It just means, hey, you're not on that trial. And now you're probably going to go back to the juror's waiting room. After cause removals, and there's going to be peremptory challenges. Each side will get a certain number of, uh, of challenges. Basically, a way you can remove a juror from the jury, the potential jury, for no reason at all. That's why it's called a peremptory challenge. You don't need a reason. There's some limitations in Washington State about race and things like that, which is important because there have been situations in different areas of the country where you know, a prosecutor supposedly might try to remove certain people from a certain uh, race to benefit their case. Um, but for basically there doesn't need to be a reason to remove someone. So if you get removed for a peremptory challenge, again, don't take it personally. It just means you're not on that, that case. And there's some reason in the attorney's head where they thought, hey, you may not be the best jury, juror for my particular position in this jury trial. So um, if once we go through all those challenges and situations now, whoever's left in the box, that's the jury. Okay, and if you're on the jury, then now it's a totally different situation that's going to happen. Everybody else goes back to the room to wait. Maybe they're discharged because there's no more juries for the day. And now you await instructions from the court. So how a jury trial typically proceeds is basically the court will give you some instructions about what the ground rules are for a juror. Typically, you can't discuss the case outside of court. You can't uh, deliberate with the jury until the case is over. Basically, you're just watching. You might be able to take notes in some courtrooms and some courtrooms not. And then once you've been instructed, typically the, the case will start with an opening statement by the, by the plaintiff, an opening statement by the defense. The plaintiff if puts on witnesses that you get to listen to. The defense puts on witnesses that you get to listen to. Um, there's going to be uh, closing arguments. And then finally, instructions about how you are to deliberate as a juror. So the jury does not get to ask questions during the trial. They don't get to raise their hand and say, hey, I want to know this, or where's the DNA, stuff like that. Um, once you get uh, through the case and the case is submitted to the jury, you're going to go to a different room than the jury waiting room typically to make a decision with the other jurors is who has the plaintiff proven their case or not. Beyond a reasonable doubt, if it's a criminal case, uh, 
more likely than not preponderance of the evidence if it's a civil case about money or damages or an injunction or something. Um, and uh, at that point, you may be able to ask written questions, not to witnesses, but to the court about procedure. Hey, can we look at that exhibit again? Or can we get a copy of this testimony or uh, that photo? And the parties outside of your presence will decide how that works. And then um, eventually you're going to make a decision or not as jurors. Typically, you've already you choose a four person to sort of be the one responsible for running the deliberations and for delivering the verdict. And you're going to have instructions likely that you're to follow in definitions in the jury room. And in criminal matters, for you to reach a verdict, it has to be a unanimous decision. And if you can't reach a verdict, it's called a hung jury. And then um, basically the judge declares a mistrial and then the prosecution can retry the defendant or not. It's up to them. In a civil matter, um, there may be a different number of agreements that has to happen based upon the type of case, which I won't get into here. But basically, after the deliberation is over, um, you render your verdict or say you can't reach a verdict as a group. And then that is we go back into the courtroom. You're back in the jury box with the participants. The verdict is read. And then if there's uh, a conviction, an acquittal, or a hung jury, any of those, typically each side has the right to poll the jury. That just means, juror, was this your verdict? Was this the verdict of the group? Yes and yes or no and no. They're not asking you at that time about why. Okay. And once everything is done and the jury is discharged, then in most courts you're allowed to, to wait and talk to the parties if you want. It's up to the judge. Oftentimes that they'll say, why did you decide this way? Or why, why did you decide that way? The losing side might want to know that. The winning side might want to know that. You got to follow instructions of the court. Um, will your information be public? Uh, it could be made public with the right type of public disclosure request to see who the jurors were. But in most cases, no one's going to follow up with you or stuff like that. How long will, it, will the trial take? Well, a criminal trial, if it's a non-felony, it might take a day or two. It's a felony trial in superior court. So only superior courts can do felony trials. It could take weeks, okay? Um, civil trials, they could take a couple days to a couple weeks as well. So think about that because you're not going to get paid much for being on the, the, the jury. You'll get a daily fee typically from the court for being called for jury duty. And for the most of the time you're called not just for one day, you might be called for multiple days. You might be called for an entire week. Um, and so each court is different. Look at what you've got on your summons for jury duty. If you don't show up for jury duty, what typically happens, they'll just keep summoning you until they show up. I think they can go after you if you're for a crime, which I've never seen, but um, they don't go away easily. So I think it's important to participate if you can. It was interesting for me, even though I got on the jury and then all of a sudden wasn't on the jury. It was uh, two or three days of waiting around, but uh, it helped me put out this video so something good came from it. So if you find this video useful, please like and please subscribe. More people will get to see it. More importantly, if you have a legal problem, a criminal problem, if it's your call in my firm in Washington State, please feel free to give me a call. We'll identify a way forward. We'll also figure out what happened and we will be there for you. Thank you. Thank you.